Today's video is here to help you if you want to become that mad Jedi of DIY metal fabrication competency, of which you've always dreamed if it weren't for the terror inherent in anything to do with working on metal. And terror is the word. The prospect of metal work just strikes terror into the hearts of some dudes, despite the fact that they are actually quite good at cutting, gluing, screwing wood, right? I've never understood that and metal's not that hard. It's just a slightly different domain and some adaptation is required. Step one, you're gonna have to cut it up, right? This is some 50 by 50 by three millimeter thick galvanized steel tube. And I cut about 30 different bits of it up yesterday using this saw. It's a Vivor 14 inch 355 millimeter tungsten carbide tipped chop saw. And you can orient the fixed jaw on the vise to plus or minus 45 degrees so you can cut pretty cool mitres and pretty cool T-joints and whatever else you need commonly to build the kinds of things that dudes build out of tube like this, which would be substantial gates, privacy screens, fences, things of that nature. Wouldn't make a bad fence post actually, and you have to cut that up too. The problem with anything you've got to fabricate is that the cuts really matter. They have to be accurate. If they're not accurate, you're going to have mitres, kind of exaggerated, but like that. And that means your parts aren't going to be to spec. And when you get them to spec, like to dimensional spec, you're going to have these massive gaps to fill. And there's going to be knock-on effects to that. It's going to take forever to fill the gaps. It's going to look crap until the end of time kind of thing. Better just to get the cuts right up front. And I have to say that compared with the default setting for cutting metal up in one shed, which would be the ubiquitous five inch friggin angle grinder, although obviously not with a paint stripping disc on it. So with a cutting disc, got one here, got one here, really do, got one here, <laughs> with a cutting disc on it, one of these super thin cutting discs. This thing just cuts through tube like this, like butter. It's really good, it's effective, it's clean, and it's much less dangerous, right? It's the, the hits just keep on coming. In fact, I did a test with this. It takes eight seconds with this saw to do a clean 90 degree cut, and it takes 12 seconds to do a 45. Like, compare that to doing it with an angle grinder and the angst involved, because with an angle grinder, you have gotta mark each one of the cuts and you've got to keep reorienting the tube so you can get the disc on top of the bit that you're cutting now, like that. And it's dangerous because it might pinch the disc when it actually comes loose if you're not really careful about how you set it up. Whereas this thing is just set and forget. You put a piece of tube in here, you lock it down with the vise, you drop the blade on it, make sure you're in the right spot, obviously on the tube, and Eight seconds later, two thumbs up. Next. So that's kind of cool. It's, in fact, it's beyond cool. It's a real upgrade to one's fundamental fabrication setup. And a saw like this is like 418 bucks at the moment, I think. And there's a discount if you use my code. So you'll get it for less than 400 bucks. I haven't worked out what the discount is, but it'll be under 400 bucks and it'll really lift your game. Now, I guess if I was going to set up a factory and the purpose of the factory was going to be the fabrication of lots of stuff, I would probably buy uh, what they call a cold saw. And the only problem with that for home is a cold saw with slightly less capacity than this is going to cost three and a half grand. And if you want a name brand like Brobo or something like that, that's going to cost you eight grand. And hey, if you're making box trailers in a factory, then yay, or bull bars, or tow hitches, or anything of that nature, then you can afford that, no problem. Like, you, you're spitting these things out. Everyone's got a ka invoice on the end of it. All good. But for home, the economics really don't add up, do they? And the other options, like the hacksaw, you've got to be kidding me. Like, that's a good experience job. Good experience for The Apprentice, you know, or in television, they'd call that uh, real opportunity for you. 
I don't know what the opportunity is. It's an opportunity for someone else not to have to suffer through it, I think. Anyway, and the angle grinder is a very dangerous tool in the wrong hands. And the thing that it's worst at is large scale cutting. Angle grinders are good at a whole bunch of things, but cutting tube like this is not one of those things. So the uh, equivalent abrasive chop saw, which I've also got from Vivor, is slightly less than 200 bucks. And I did a test on it. The same cut, this 90 degree cut, that took eight seconds on the tungsten carbide saw, which just eats this material like butter. The same thing with the abrasive saw took 35 seconds. So that's roughly four times longer and with a whole lot more fuss, I have to say, because there's a whole lot of red hot sparks come off the abrasive saw. There's an inherent fire danger, which is quite significant here in Australia when you're looking down the barrel of another long hot summer with very dry conditions. So you have to be mindful of that. And it just takes longer, it's noisier, it's more dangerous. You have to protect your lungs because the dust from abrasive sores is quite toxic. And ditto the dust that comes off these babies for your angle grinder, quite toxic. And a lot of DIYers don't seem to think that matters, but trust me, it does, particularly if the blade is black because black blades are generally functional because of their silicon carbide content and it's probably the worst abrasive from a respiratory danger point of view. You've got to be mindful of that. At the very least, wear a mask. And if you're doing a ton of this stuff, you should invest in a uh, purified air, a PAPA, you know, forced ventilation respiratory thing with a filter on a backpack, you know. That would be how you would be forced to do this in industry, right? And that would be for a reason. Just for kicks, I also compared another 90 degree cut on exactly the same material using the Vivor BS85 bandsaw that I reviewed a few months ago. So I'll stick a link up there if you would like to check that out. It's a capable little saw. It doesn't have as big a footprint as this. It's slightly lighter and easier to move around, but the cuts take substantially longer. This one simple 90 degree cut, uh, just over a minute on the BS85, a minute four seconds, I think was the test cut I did. And both of these cuts are done without pressuring the tool, like just letting it go at its own pace, because in both cases, that's gonna, maximize the life of the blade, which in the case of these 14 inch tungsten carbide tipped saws is quite expensive. But if you just let it go at its own pace, you'll get probably a thousand or more cuts of material like this out of a blade such as this. And if you've got a lot of it to do, imagine the difference when you've got a hundred cuts to do. If you're saving like 50 seconds, on a hundred cuts. That's like 500 seconds of not standing behind a machine putting the handle down. I'll take that every day. So if you've got three gates and a privacy screen and you want to build two workbenches and some shelving, then a saw like this for about 400 bucks, to me, it makes real sense. And just look at the quality of that surface finish. It's really good straight off the gun. In fact, the bits come apart, they're cool enough to touch. There's no salient rise in the temperature whatsoever. And you need bugger all cleanup as well. I think you'd agree that's pretty clean, right? Straight off the saw with absolutely no touch up from me with anything. It just comes off the gun like that. And provided you can get the fence in the right place for these cuts, the fit is really slick. You're not gonna have any problem putting the parts together. I'll just give you a good look at the fit here. That's pretty sweet. From a fit point of view, I wouldn't want it to be any better than that. You don't need to do any special preparation, deburring or anything for welding. But one caveat on welding galvanized is it's really dangerous, okay? So what I'm going to do with these before I weld them is I'm gonna get a flap disc, like this, maybe a sanding disc, whatever I've got at hand. And I'm just gonna come back about 20 millimeters from all of the welds and knock the galvanizing off. Because once you're doing your Jedi spraying of whatever into a molten pool, if there is zinc in there, which is the fundamental constituent of galvanizing, once you ionize the crap out of that, the vapor is extremely dangerous for you to breathe. So don't do that. 
and there's a couple of ways of getting the zinc off. You could also just duck the ends in about 20 millimeter deep pool of vinegar and just leave it there for a couple of days and the vinegar, the acid in the vinegar will eat the zinc and leave you with some pretty clean steel to do the welding on. And then just spray it with cold gal and paint it the way you were going to anyway. And there won't be any elevated salient corrosion risk with any of that and you won't poison yourself in the process. So that's a pretty good safety tip. Now, when you use a saw like this, you'll note that it does cut like butter, but the chips kind of go everywhere. And they're not exactly Satan's fingernails, so there's not too much risk there, but I'd be wearing safety boots when I do this, I'd be wearing safety specs, I'd be wearing hearing protection, and I'd be making sure that I had long pants on that went over the tops of the boots, otherwise your feet are just going to fill up with those sharp metal chips and not fun either. They are kind of Satan's fingernails when they get down there. The other thing that comes in really handy from a cleanup point of view, because you've got these metal chips everywhere, is a swarf wand, which is just really a magnet on a stick and you can turn it on and off by pulling a plunger. It makes the cleanup of the bulk of the material really simple. And it's not just useful for cutting, it's useful for drilling and all of that kind of stuff. They sell them for I don't know, 40 or 50 bucks. They're, uh, they're a brilliant tool to have just around for general shop cleanup. And you can put them anywhere, you know. <laughs> They've got to roll away on you if you put them down on the right surface. The final thing I'd say about the chips, if you know anything about machining, is that tungsten carbide is a really good material for machining steel. And you can tell a lot from the nature of the chips if you know anything about that. And these chips come off in that straw to blue color range. So the steel actually gets quite specifically hot briefly, like north of 200 degrees C, very briefly. And that's a hallmark of really efficient cutting. And one of the tips I'd give you here is if you can, you should orient your material so that you get the least number of teeth engaged in the job for every cut. So for example, rather if you've got a piece of flat bar to cut like this, okay, this is 50 by 12, this flat bar here, focus. Instead of cutting it flat like this, put it on its end, like put it on its end in the vise like that to cut it. And you'll get the fewest number of teeth engaged in the cut, which will give you better blade life. Likewise, if you're cutting a piece of angle, put it like that. Put it flat down on the table like that and clamp the vise here and here and that'll give you the best result from a tooth engagement point of view. If you've got a V-block and you're doing a straight cut, you can mount square tube just like this and that will also give you better uh, blade life. So it would sit there like that. Don't do this without a V-block, okay? V-block is kind of not negotiable for this kind of cutting. There we go. There's your basic machining cheapy V-block. You can put a V-block kind of here in the setup and that will allow you safely to clamp your tube this way. It'll take a little bit of rigging to do that. in your own time. But that would be better from a tooth engagement point of view because you get, you know, the least dragging. When you've got the tube like this, if it's flat, then the saw blade actually works quite hard when it's cutting the top surface and the bottom surface and it cuts through the walls, the vertical walls with ease, right? If you've got this kind of setup, it takes that hard work at the horizontal surfaces out of it. The problem with this is if you're cutting mitres, you can't cut mitres in this way. So you kind of have to have the tube flat on the bed of the saw for the mitres. I just want to talk specifically to you now. If you are that angle grinder aficionado who thinks that the angle grinder is the universal cutting solution. If you've got to cut through a 760 UB113, just use an angle grinder, dude. And I would say to you, that yeah, you could use an angle grinder to cut through virtually anything, and people do, but in the home fabrication environment, angle grinders get more dangerous the more significant the cut, because 
The cutting blade is flimsy and it's moving really fast and it's super easy to do the number one venial sin of using an angle grinder, which is to get your head in the plane of rotation just like this, right? If you're looking down the edge of the blade like that, you are doing it wrong. If you remove the guard, you're doing it wrong because if the disc comes apart, the fragments are going to basically follow the plane of rotation. And if you are in the plane of rotation, they might head for you. And you don't want that at 11,000 RPM, which is nearly 200 revs a second kind of thing. That is unthinkable. And because they're so easy to move, it's easy to find yourself in the plane of rotation. It's also pretty easy to cut your fingers off. And if the blade jams, this is why never take the handle off an angle grinder, always have both hands on the angle grinder. Really hard to cut your fingers off with both hands on the angle grinder. Really easy if you're doing holding something like this or like this, right? Really easy to just, so many nerves in the human hand. Like just don't do that. Never take the guard off, dude. I'm not anti-angle grinder. They're really good. They're really good with these paint stripping discs, which are also great for removing mill scale and galvanizing. They're fantastic with our flap disc. I love me a good flap disc. They're awesome, quite safe as well, comparatively. I really, really like them with these flexible rubber pads and a sanding disc. That's freaking awesome. They just eat material like that. They're really good for doing big flat surfaces, dressing up a ghetto welding table. They're fantastic for that. And the cutting discs are even awesome if you use them judiciously. If you just want to cut little corners off something, just because you're going to radius them on your belt grinder or something, then they're great at that. If you need to shorten a drill because you need to get it into a confined space and you've got a long job of drill and you want to cut some of the shank off, they're great at that. Or if you want to cut a hex key down for Christ knows what reason, anything hard, like harder than this kind of steel, the cheese of steel, the camembert cheese of steel, your low carbon structural steel, anything harder than that, abrasives work really well. Which brings me to an important point with this saw, don't cut anything hard with this kind of saw. It's only designed to be used on structural grade steel. So I had this little job where I wanted to cut down these clamps, which are Christ knows where, everything subscribes to the second law of thermodynamics. Anyway, I wanted to cut, hang on, I got these four clamps and I bought them intentionally long. They started out like this and I used the abrasive chop saw to cut these down because the shanks of these clamps, the main bar that resists all the bending when you screw them up, it's quite hard. And I would not do this with a saw such as this because I'd just be endlessly feeding it new blades, which kind of defeats the purpose. You know, the blades are expensive. So abrasives, either an angle grinder or an abrasive chop saw are fantastic in the context of cutting things that are quite hard, like harder than structural steel. And you do have to wear your breathing protection and they do work really fast. Like that abrasive cutoff saw is about the same diameter as this saw, but it rotates at 3,600 RPM. This saw is spinning at 1200 RPM. So from the point of view of the mayhem that it can release, this saw much less, just because it's not going as fast and energy is proportional to speed. And also this blade is much more robust than an abrasive disc. And therefore, you've, you just feel like you're at more risk if you're using an abrasive disc, like an abrasive disc in one of these babies or an abrasive disc in one of these babies. The other thing I'd suggest is someone's going to have a bright idea, which will be, I'll get a metal cutting blade and put it in a wood saw, like a drop saw, you know. Also a terrible idea because the speed will be wrong. Therefore, the cutting will be wrong. It'll be really dangerous. Don't do that. If you're going to cut metal with a tungsten carbide tipped saw blade, then you need a specific saw because it'll run at the right speed to correspond with the feed rate that you need to do efficient cutting. That's really important. It's very difficult to adapt 
a wood saw to metal cutting for mild steel. That's almost impossible and most people who try it get it spectacularly wrong, I note. Even though I'm sure you can find a YouTube video on it if you want to do that. Uh, the other thing angle grinders are a bit good at is wire brushing. They're quite good at that as well, although that tends to be a little bit hard on your hands because the wire brushes don't tend to be very well balanced and therefore there's a lot of vibration which kind of gets into the nerves of your hands and I wouldn't be trying to organize a career of hours and hours every day of using a wire brush with an angle grinder because it's probably going to work out badly for the nerves in your hands so there's that. Another tool that often gets a run cutting up bits of steel such as this would be the recipro saw. You can get your demolition recipro saw whatever you want to call it. I think in America they call it a sawzall. If you want to use one of them for cutting up metal, you can get a tungsten carbide tipped blade for them and they just eat metal as well. The only problem is the cuts are shit. Like the cuts, and by that I mean it's, it's really hard to be accurate. So a sawzall is really good for breaking something down. If you've got some piece of welded up monstrosity that's superfluous to requirements and you want to cut it up so you can dispose of it easier, then a sawzall is a great tool for doing that. But it's absolutely crap at doing accurate cuts for constructing something that some other bastard is going to want to pull to pieces and throw in the bin after you croak. Before I let you go, it strikes me that there's often a great focus on the tool and not so much focus on the technique. And if you're kind of new to metalwork, then you need to focus on the technique as well because the tool's not going to do it on its own, dude. Like, you're going to have to step up as well. And the first thing I'd suggest from an advice point of view is use uh, CAD cardboard aided design in my case you know draw yourself a little diagram of your stuff and then from your diagram you can derive a cut list and the cut list only has to make sense to you but when you're cutting stuff that's got mitres and square cuts and sometimes it's got a mitre in this plane and a mitre in that plane it's got to make sense to you and you've got to get those cuts right because material is expensive. So have a cut list. And then at the other end of have a cut list, you've named all your parts. You know, you've got col outside vertical column, whatever. Then write the names of the parts on the bit when you cut it. Because next weekend, when you crank up the welder, you don't have to figure out what all the parts are because you labelled them. Makes it really easy. I mean, obviously, it's pretty easy if you're making a gate because you've got rails and sides and then bits that infill in the middle. But if you're making something complex, labelling the parts makes real sense. I'd also suggest that when you get a new piece of material, like you've just got your big long lengths delivered off the back of a truck and you're going to cut them up, the first thing you should do is just take a real shallow cut off the end, like a reference cut. And that just changes the crappy finish from the factory cut into a high quality finish compatible with all the other cuts that you're going to do. And when you start from a good reference cut, you can make a good first reference measurement. And that makes real sense as well if you want to end up with fewer problems in the assembly and finished product stage, right? One of the worst things you can mark your cuts out with is the ubiquitous sharpie, right? Everyone does this. I see it all the time. They're making cut marks with a sharpie on a piece of steel. The problem with that is that steel's really not amenable to being out by three millimeters or two millimeters or whatever the, the width of your sharpie is. Instead, you should graduate. You shouldn't throw your sharpie away, but you should graduate it to the ghetto version of engineering layout fluid. So you should measure where you want the cut approximately with your tape measure and then just mark a wide sort of area with your sharpie and if you want to do the layout accurately get yourself one of these these things are cheap and they're so useful you'll never go back it's a tungsten carbide scriber it's much harder than the steel and it marks a really thin accurate line and if you've got the blue underneath it the line that you scribe with this baby is really easy to see. And then you just have to remember which side is the waste side because 
you make sure that you cut on the waist side, just like you do with wood, if you understand that concept. I always put an X on the waist side in case the phone rings and I forget, right? If the blade is over on the X side of the accurate line that I've just scribed, I know it's in the right place and I know I'm always aiming for trying to be within about a millimetre of what I set the dimension at. Even on parts that don't matter, like it's a good idea to get into the mindset of accuracy matters. And if accuracy matters all the time, then when it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, but you're good at it, you get better at it. Like you're training for accuracy the whole time. If you do everything accurate, then when it really matters, your accuracy is two thumbs up, right? That makes real sense as well. Now, you can check the blade angle as well because obviously there are marks on the saw, on the vise, but they're only approximate and you want them to be more accurate than this. The first thing I did was I set the fence up properly at the right angles, 90 and 45 are quite important. So when I had the fence set up properly relative to the blade, I scribed lines using my scriber on the table at plus and minus 45 and at 90 so that it makes it easy to orient the fence accurately to the job. And to measure the accuracy I used for the 90 degree bit, I use one of these babies, which is a one, two, three block. They're cheap and really accurate. They're a hardened and precision ground piece of steel that is one inch by two inches by three inches and all the surfaces are at 90 degrees. So it makes it easier to get in here and just, you know, check 90 degrees on the blade, check 90 degrees on the blade vertically and check 90 degrees on the blade horizontally relative to the fence. Okay, that's kind of important. And then for the 45s, I just took a cheap square apart and used the 45 reference there. But if you've got, you know, a welding square, you could use the 45 on it if you can fit it in, or a bigger welding square like that might come in handy as well. Certainly these things come in handy for sticking the whole project together accurately after the fact. So once you've got the blade at the right angle, then you can kind of just start to use it. But a really important tip is when you've got these cuts, you know, you've got your two cuts and they sit together like that. When you're actually sticking the part together, don't just assume that's 90 degrees. And if it's not 90 degrees, set it up with a bit of a gap in it, clamp it down and make it on dimension and then deal with the gap. Don't make the part the wrong angle intentionally and then try to deal with it down the track. Because once it's not square, it's really hard to get it square because you welded it up and it's just a freaking disaster. And you're likely to be out by one or two degrees and if you've got a gap that's within a couple of millimetres, then you can just deal with that in the fabrication process. I see a lot of dudes just sticked up stuff together and kind of hope it's right and wonder why their jobs end up looking like this and nothing ever sits flat, right? So the dimensions really matter, not the parts, okay? If the part's slightly small, then just pat it out, put a bit of a gap in there and deal with it in fabrication. And if it's too big, just crank your saw up again and take a couple of millimetres off. And that's going to make your life so much easier when you're actually using the part, trying to fit it into an aperture or whatever. That To me, it just makes sense to build the thing to the dimension and not just default to the size of the parts that you have cut. These tungsten carbide tipped structural steel chop saws are a relatively new development. And they're quite exciting to me because they bridge the gap in between dodging up the cuts with an angle grinder and all of the inherent time wasting and risk that goes with that. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the option, if that's the right word, of dropping three and a half to 8,000 bucks on a hardcore industro spec cold saw. This does cold sawing at a fraction of the cost and it'll save you a bunch of time and the cut quality is like ready to weld if it's not galvanized. And for all these reasons, it's a brilliant upgrade with a fantastic value proposition at about 400 bucks. There's a link and a code in the description to this video if you're interested in picking one up. There's no pressure there. I'm going to get a commission if you do buy one and I'll use it to do other videos like this on the channel, obviously. When you don't need this saw, it doesn't take up much space in your workshop either. It just folds up like that and then it's a one-handed carry just. 
find a bit of shelf space, shove it in there, or if you work on site often enough, just chuck it in the back of the ute and it'll sit there like that happily until you get where you're going. I know this has been a reasonably long video. Hopefully you've come away with some actionable tips on just upping your fabrication game. And if that's the case, I'm quite happy about that. And my work here is done. I'll see you on the next one.